morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone wherever you are. Warm greetings from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. My name is Maria Tio and I'm hosting Patronas Future Talks 2021 from the majestic Patronas Twin Towers, home to Patronas, Malaysia's national oil and gas company and a Fortune Global 500 energy company with presence in over 50 countries. You're joining me at Patronas Future Talks 2021 with the theme Stewardship in Energy Sustainability with Technology Research and Development. Patronas Future Talks intends to exchange ideas in unlocking new opportunities and shaping the long-term landscape for future energy and technology. Today's session will be focusing on talent development for R&D, building new types of capability and venturing out from core business. Across industries and organizations, R&D function plays an important role in converting innovative ideas into products and services that deliver competitive edge. To ensure a high functioning human capital, it is imperative to have an effective talent development program for R&D employees to increase capabilities, both leadership and functional and our retaining talents. We will hear ideas from our thought leaders on how we must repaint our human capital landscape to move in tandem with the advancement of technology and innovation. I am honored to be sharing this stage with remarkable people leaders from the vibrant energy industry and speed lining world of motorsports and a renowned professor who spoke at World Economic Forum in 2016. I am nervous to be honest, after reading their profiles and Googling to find out more about them, uh, which I will be sharing with you right away as a mean of introduction. First of all, let me introduce someone who is closely affiliated to me in Patronas, Madam Farehana Hanapia. She is currently the Senior Vice President of Group Human Resource Management in Patronas. Madam Fare, as we fondly call her, has clocked in slightly more than 30 years with this organization, holding various senior leadership roles throughout her career. Leading to her appointment as Senior Vice President, she led Petrina's People Strategy and a group of experts in the fields of remuneration, organization development and design, industry relations and talent acquisition. Prior to that, she was the Chief Executive Officer of Petrina's Leadership Center. She grew up in, in the organization leading commercial and joint venture development and led corporate strategic planning. She graduated with bachelor degree in commerce and administration, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of New Zealand. Such a diverse background and experience. Next, in, next is someone from the vroom vroom world of motorsports, Mr. Paul Mills. Um, Paul is a um, chief people officer at Mercedes AMG Petronas F1. He has over 25 years of experience in human resources. Paul is a Chartered Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, CIPD, and has a Master of Business Admin from Warwick Business School. Interestingly, Paul spent most, most of his career in automotive industry in variety of HR roles, namely, namely Ford Motor Company, Siemens, Volvo Cars, and Jaguar Land Rover. He also completed overseas assignments in Detroit, USA, and Gothenburg, Sweden. Paul is passionate in people and organization performance, and since joining in Mercedes in 2012, he has been a part of a team that has won an unprecedented seven World Constructors and World Drivers Championships in Formula One, and is still motivated to win more. Our final panel speaker um, is Professor Mary Ryan. You can see how nervous I am. <laughs> Professor uh, Mary is currently the Vice Dean for Research in the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial College London. She's also Professor of Material Science and Nanotechnology in the same university. Professor Mary is a Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Minings, and of the Institute of Corrosion. Joined Imperial in 1998, she now leads Imperial Sustainability Research Strategy the transition to zero pollution. And she is a director of the Imperial Shell Te University Technology Center for Advanced Materials. Among other advisory roles, she is chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Research Complex at Howell, a member of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council Scientific Advisory Network, the Diamond Light Source Scientific Advisory Board, 
Royal Air Force Museum Research Board and the UK Heating and Cooling Network. Please say hello to Madam Pare, Paul and Professor Mary. What an illustrious oh. career each one of you have. Such a mouthful to, to say all these achievements that you have done, um, you know, throughout many, many years uh, in your areas of specialization. So without further ado, let's start our panel session. Um, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful again to have all of you um, joining this session. Um, for once, Petrina's future talks will be, we're going to be very interesting talking about, you know, talents development and capabilities. So I would like to start um, perhaps with uh, Fare um, on Petrina's in embarking this target MFT 5030, moving forward together 5030. Um, you want to talk a little bit about MFT and how Petronas is pre preparing its human capital in undertaking this mammoth task ahead. Over to you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, this will be a shot at different times so this morning, noon and night, <laughs> I'm sure. But thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm some of the things that we'll be talking about is in context of Petronas, but I think I look forward to the rest of the panels in, in trying to search for some answers as well, Maria. So what I'll do from a from a just context point of view is share what we're trying to do in Petronas um, and, and raise some of the key areas, I guess, where we're still, uh, you know, um, looking at how best we can approach it. As you know, um, Early of last year, we announced the MFT, the Moving Forward Together. This is in light of the whole energy transition that is happening um, globally, and that will be um, a huge threat to many oil and gas companies. Um, uh, you know, for the, with the likes of uh, Petronas, if we stay the way we are, uh, you know, the, the talks that we're hearing already in, in COP26 will show that you know there is an existential threat to a lot of the companies if we just stay where we are. So early of last year, we made that decision, the leadership team um, made a decision to really rethink about where we're heading. Um, and uh, okay, I've got some background noise. I don't know whether you're picking it up, but uh, when we call this moving forward together, it's, it's really trying to balance our core really maximizing the value of the existing core and, and, and through that generating as much cash as possible. So we call that 50% improvement in our cash flow from our existing assets. But at the same time, really setting up uh, what we would feel would be a uh, aspirational target of getting at least 30% new revenue from new revenues from new revenue streams. Um, and this means really just pushing, you know, the, the whole thinking from just uh, uh, currently call oil and gas, petrochemicals to uh, rebranding ourselves in, as an energy company, really thinking around uh, problem solving and delivering solutions to our customers. And the third pillar, which is going to be a really, really important pillar, is all about sustainability. And uh, there was a huge uh, debate around what would that really be? And we, we decided that we want to commit to the net zero carbon emission. Uh, by 2050. So again, this is a hot uh, debate, and I, I, you know, I can bring both Paul and Mary, Mary to talk about uh, a lot of these things. Is this real? Uh, is can uh, you know an energy company commit to that? Um, and what does it mean to us in terms of our ability to uh, generate future revenues and also you know be attracting best talents? So when we talk about this, you know, you know the whole uh, moving patronage from core hydrocarbons to, you know, going into new energy and renewables. Already we started, uh, you know, developing what we call our innovative engine effort, really uh, getting the whole uh, group to start thinking about new uh, sources of uh, income, uh, new sources of revenue. And, and we're going, uh, working with partners to come up with what we call uh, innovative approaches to, to come up with new ideas. Um, and how to really scale those ideas into real uh, uh, enterprises, real uh, new ventures. Um, uh, the, the, the research team is critical in this because they are the base of a lot of the innovation. You know, when we talk about hydrogen, we talk about specialty chemicals, we're talking about renewables, a lot of that will really look back 
to the people who are doing a lot of the research. And, and we all felt that one of the things that we need to do is start bringing them out from the labs, really help them commercialize, find real applications. I, I think that there's a lot of application already for within Petronas. We're also thinking about making a lot more commercialization uh, beyond just the use uh, of Petronas. Really, you know, you're doing a lot of the, the technologies that we develop in house and really leveraging it on uh, for others outside of the industry. And even thinking of new applications, things that we thought would had only served uh, the oil and gas, for example, now has a new a new uh, application. Um, so, so this is really asking us to to rethink a lot of the things that we're doing. Uh, we're embracing new ways of working. The pandemic, as we all know, has has changed the way we thought about work. You know, most of us are at home at the moment, you know, uh, doing this uh, uh, this talk. But you know, this also means that uh, Maria, from a talent um, attraction point of view. I remember those days we said, you know, we want to bring the best talents, but why would they want to come to Malaysia? And, and there was a little joke, why would they want to come to Bani, right? <laughs> but now we're saying, you know, with, with collaboration, we can tap the best experts across the world. It doesn't matter where they are. As long as we've got a really great purpose, they see us as a, a, a company who's willing to make a change. Uh, we're part of the problem solving around the, the, the whole energy uh, solutioning rather than being the blockers, I think we can really attract a lot of talents across the globe and really make uh, you know, the, the aspiration we set for ourselves a reality. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful contact. Mary, any, any thoughts from academic point of view? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of what you've said really resonates with a lot of things that our students are saying and things that we see that our students care about. And I think one of the big aspects about attracting talent is being seen as a company that's doing something that people care about. And this, these generations of um, students have kind of a much more values-based perspective on the world, right? They want to be doing something that makes a difference. Um, and, they're, and they're pushing us as the, at the university to demonstrate that we're doing things and teaching them things and helping them in that pathway. And that's what they're looking for in, from employers. And so I think for an, for an energy company, a, a transitioning energy company from oil and gas to renewables and to more sustainable um, operations, it is a big challenge, and it, and you're right, it's a lot of innovation required in that challenge, um, and and that reflects back on us as as a an education and a research establishment. How do we prepare students to enter that kind of world where they have to work in this? You know, it's a really fast time frame. If we're going to make a difference in the climate crisis, that the rate of change has to be really dramatic compared to anything we've seen before. So so. We need to create students with a different mindset, actually, in, in, in order to recognise that pace of change and be able to adapt to it. So a few things. One of the things we've done at Imperial quite recently, so the last three years, it's probably three years ago now. Everyone's lost a year, right? So it's probably three years ago now. But um, so we, did, we did a big review of, the, of our, our whole curriculum across all of our departments um, to, to look back at, you know, what are we teaching? How are we teaching it? Why are we teaching this, this, these different syllabi, right? And, and it, are they still fit for purpose? And, and in that, there's a recognition that a lot of the requirements for, for industry and, and different different jobs now require a lot of this interdisciplinary ability. But to be able to be interdisciplinary, you have to have a really strong disciplinary core, right? So, so you have to make your syllabus reflect that you've got a strong core of a discipline, you know, mechanical engineering, materials in my in my case, computer science. But on top of that, you're, you're, you recognize, I guess, the, the, the cross-disciplinary nature of the future of work, and you're able to think a little bit outside your own box. We also recognize that quite often when, when important things arise and, and you want to change the dynamic, and we might be talking about responsible innovation or sustainability, those things get sort of tagged on the end. So you'll do all your normal work and then a tag on at the end that, that talks about sustainability. And, th and that's not fit for purpose, right? We have to, throughout all of our courses, embed sustainability, embed um, innovation, and embed responsibility in that space. And so that means reworking a little bit how we are doing the teaching, right? And, and how you frame some of the, the discussions around te technology development and, um, and even, you know, even thermodynamics, right? When you're talking about using thermodynamics, say for metal extraction, which, we, which is something I've taught in the past, Framing that in a how is it sustainable and what ways might you do it in a sustainable way is, is part of how we, we're changing the, the conversation. 
I think there are some other things that we need that are clearly going to make a difference, right? So things like digital literacy, right? Everybody now has to be able to do that. Um, understanding of automation, systems thinking, right? So understanding how what you do connects to all of the different parts of a, of a system is really important. And that's that's a challenge to teach, actually. And, and so thinking about innovative ways, the way you can bring different groups of students together so they get perspectives on the different topics is something we're working at, mostly at the graduate level. And then it's slowly how do we embed that with our undergraduates as well. I think just I'll just make one final point and to, to your point on how we how when people come to you, say from Imperial, and you want to put them in this dynamic environment where they understand innovation and translation. So first of all, that kind of entrepreneurial translation idea has to be embedded. They have to think about how something is going to go from the lab to the real world. But then I think we have to be really careful that we don't send people out who are constrained in their thinking, right? So they should have, I like to call it the freedom to imagine, but also the obligation to question, right? So the obligation to question how things are being done, right? Is this the right way? Is there a better way? And then the freedom to imagine a different way to do it, right? Because that's the kind of mix that gives you innovation and new thinking and hopefully translation into the to the real world. Yeah. So talking about real world, I think Paul is definitely in this hot. He's in the real world. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you, you, you've been, your team has been working in a multidisciplinary pod, right? Um, but I'm sure in a world of motorsports where things are very, very fast paced, um, what kind of challenges do you see? And, you know, how is Mercedes AMG is overcoming all this? Yeah. Well, you know, I'd like to come at, um, at this question with a discussion around attracting talent. Um, I mean, first of all, thanks for the introduction. And uh, it's a great honour to be on um, this fabulous panel with our fantastic title sponsor. And uh, what, a, what a great professor from a great university to have on, on the panel. So thanks for the invitation. I'm delighted to, uh, to participate. Um, so coming at it from the attraction point of view, I mean, we spend time, you know, thinking about talent. Over the years, talent used to be about small proportion of the market, super duper people, um, you know, the elite top 5% or whatever it might be. And um, certainly in my experience and our, our sort of approach here, um, now talent, we're talking about everybody in our organisation. We've got, a, you know, a thousand people in our team um, another thousand that work in our engines group and our mindset is ev every one of those is a talent. Um, we we rely on our people. Formula One is a is a supremely people um, oriented um, sport and you know the caliber and the contribution, the innovation, the creativity, the determination, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, these are the differentiators in our sport. Um, but the technology, you know, is pretty much standard and pretty much shared, you know, plus or minus some some innovations. So so therefore, the, the difference really is is the people. And it's why, you know, I love my job so much and I love working with the, the management team here that I um, cooperate with on a daily basis because they all get how important this talent topic is. It's a top table topic. It's our management committee topic and we talk about it regularly you know pretty much all the time um so you know what we've what we found is that um you know uh, and it's a little bit what uh, what mary and farahana were saying you know the skills part um we we can rely on um, academia and um, education to to bring a level of skill and we can we can top and tail that in our our real world as you've been describing it um, what we're finding is that, you know, attitudes, motivation, resilience, um, determination, um, they, they're the differentiators and, and they're the things that are quite difficult to find. There is a huge shortage of um, skills and talent, um, certainly in, in my little microcosm of the world in, in Formula One. Um, we are in an extremely competitive environment and I think that plays out even at the scale that, um, that Farahana is dealing with at, at Patronus. You know, there is there is an amazingly competitive um, global market now for talented people. And what we're finding is that um, talented people are starting to throw their weight around. Um, you know, they they know that they are talented and, and they know that they are scarce and um, they're becoming very discerning. Uh, back in the day, you know, it was probably enough to be Patronus or it was enough to be Mercedes. 
and um, all of these people would all sort of be knocking on your door looking for the the great career that you could provide. Um, that's that's not the case anymore. And um, our audience, the, the prospective candidates, are becoming very very discerning. Um, they've got so much um, data and research available to them on the on the internet that they can do very quick compare and contrasts of companies that for all sorts of different things, for all of the ESG topics um, that we talk about all the time, you know, the environment and the social and the governance topics, um, they can check out what a company's gender pay gap is uh, in the UK. They can press a button on the internet and look at the gender pay gap of all the Formula One teams. You know, the, the, the transparency that we have to show um, to this audience is, is really quite, um, quite a challenge and it makes the, the talent out there very powerful because they could come in and they they have difficult questions um, but difficult questions to uh, to ask us. We're also dealing with something that um, I read about more in the US, but I, I just feel it in our environment. You know, there's this thing called the um, the Great Resignation going on, and um, <laughs> we're seeing that talented people are now saying, "Well, you know, uh, it's very nice Formula One, and it's a very competitive, exciting market, and yeah, everybody needs to contribute their tenths of a second. But I would like to do that three days a week, and um, I would like to spend two days um, at home, and uh, I would like to use the the Teams um, facility to in, in order to be able to do that. And I've got caring responsibilities, and I've got whatever whatever it all is. And we're in a, a negotiation with um, talent as well now about those those terms and that sort of uh, compensation. So I think um, you know it's becoming. Very, the, the, all the market's fragmented. So we used to be able to go to four or five places. We'd advertise in one place and it would all, all the applications would come. Now we're having to be playing in all sorts of different arenas. Um, the hunt for talent and, and new talent pools, I think we'll probably come to later when we talk a bit more about the diversity and inclusion aspect. But we are having to sort of broaden um, our reach into places that we wouldn't have done so previously because we need to be um, accessing these new new talent pools. So it's probably enough uh, for a starter, uh, Maria. I hope that was uh, OK for a, a start. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Paul. And I think one of the points that you highlighted is about this great resignation, right? Um, you know, the future of works also look or demand um, this battling between long term career progression vis-a-vis uh, those who come in as a gig uh, employee. Um, Mary, what's your view on that? Um, how do you then prepare our students, our potential workforce, um, you know, battling this trend of, yeah, uh, well, think, not building a career of 30 years like Farihana? <laughs> well, I think there's a, there's a few, there are a few things that um, in terms of the, the attitude of, of our students, and I think one is, I think, related to them wanting to feel valued but also to value what they do and i think they they really are much more mission driven rather than just they want to be in a comfortable salary for life position they want to be feel they're making a difference in the world they're also and i think paul alluded to this they see themselves as global citizens right they don't worry about moving around the world and so that makes them much more mobile and i think that that's a completely different mindset i think to previous generations that they have this international perspective and they recognize they can go anywhere and move anywhere and have you know great experiences and that and that their talents are actually really important i think paul is absolutely right i think there is also i think a reset in work life balance attitudes um for sure and 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 i think probably that's timely actually i think it's they're probably right in a lot of those things and maybe a reset was in order i think it's been accelerated obviously by the pandemic and i think that has this is probably something we would have got to in 10 or 20 years if we carried on our normal trajectory because we were talking about it everyone was talking about it and understanding parental leave and and, and again linking back to paternity and work-life balance but i think the the what's happened in the last 18 months has just made people realize they can work differently um and it's accelerated that change and and probably that's a good thing but i think it's a massive challenge for organizations to also make that transition in the face of all the other challenges that we've got so in terms of how we prepare people for that, I think actually we're preparing people to be innovative, to deliver the skills, to make a difference. I don't necessarily think it's our job to 
make them want to stay somewhere for life, right? Because if if that's not where they're going to make the most difference, right? We want our people to make the most difference. And if they make the most difference by moving, then I might argue that's what they should do. Um, so the challenge then in organizations is for people to feel like if they stay somewhere, one, they're going to progress, two, that they're valued, and three, that they will be able to deliver and grow, right? They also have, feel like they want to grow their skills. I think often people move for an opportunity because they think it's an opportunity to learn something new, to grow a different skill set, to, to partly for um, to make them more marketable, obviously, but also partly because there's that self-development that they want to keep challenging themselves. And, the, and these people that you want to retain are the very people that want to keep challenging themselves, right? And we see that in our students. They take on all kinds of different projects and extracurricular activities because they want to keep challenging. So how do you find those opportunities internally for people so they don't have to go and look for those challenges elsewhere? Yeah. Why do you see this as a threat or an opportunity for Petronas? It, it, you know, you, you can choose to see it as a threat, but I think looking at it from more from an opportunity point of view, actually, we gain a lot more, right? And I'm just building on what uh, Marion and Paul said. You know, the when we talk about uh, you know overall retention and development, again, I agree with Mary. We should retain people who uh, would add value, uh, would uh, want to uh, improve themselves, uh, and are empowered to improve themselves, and and want to you know uh, give a lot more uh, discretionary effort to really uh, deliver. So as an organization, we've we've set a clear purpose. Uh, we, we've, we've set very clear directions. And um, in the last few years, what we've been doing is rethinking the whole way of managing talent. And one of the things we said, and, and actually the pandemic again came in and to really test a lot of thinking that we had, right? We said, um, what if we stop talking about just retention in general? What if we redefine retention as the ability to allow people to self-develop themselves, um, make transparent career opportunities? Uh, you know, like what you mentioned, people move because they want to look for new things. They they love the new challenge. What if we make that transparent? And what if we can connect, uh, you know, career progression and learning more to be more uh, visible? Then they can make that connection. Um, and so, you know, um, they see where they can progress um, and they see, uh, you know, the, the opportunities out there. Uh, and if they, if they don't like it, I agree. Uh, we should not retain people who just won't put in that, uh, you know, that extra X factor into the job. Um, it's not going to give us that incremental uh, uh, movement that we, we need. So, you know, when, when we think about... Uh, doing this, what we actually spent doing, the last, and Maria was a big part of this, right? We actually said, can we redo the whole notion of a, a organization? Do we really have to start thinking, you know, people from, you know, just opportunities from a box point of view, for example, or, or and start thinking of them as, you know, who they are as the kind of competency that they bring to the table and their ability to grow as well. So we're looking at, you know, really looking at talent profiles and, and allowing people to, have almost like an internal LinkedIn uh, profile. They're there, they can market themselves, they can show what they're uh, able to uh, deliver, what their aspiration is. And then we said, what, what if we make uh, all the job opportunities also as an open opportunity that people know, if I need to go to this particular career path, I know exactly what is required to, to, de to develop in order for me to progress. Then we said, you know, um, I think someone was also saying about, you know, to really spur innovation, we need to have cross multidisciplinary uh, teams, right? So we said, let's stop thinking just about the individual. Let's allow the individual to de develop themselves. What organizations need to think about is how we're teaming people. How are we pulling the right or, or multiple types of skills together to spur innovation? So uh, I mentioned earlier, Maria, that you know, one of the things that we did uh, around the innovative engine was to bring... Uh, many of our people in to start thinking of new ways of, of, of uh, generating new revenues. What we found was if we bring enough diversity, uh, people, you know, one obviously is gender and age, but people from very different backgrounds, upstream, downstream, technical, technical non-technical, commercial, uh, non-commercial, getting scientists to come in, actually the level of uh, ideation is a lot more uh, and a lot more uh, interesting than if we were to just, you know, go and do this at a very um, 
insula level and a business level. So, you know, we were keen to test on these ideas. And we also found that, you know, as we were going through this, the pandemic came in. One of the things we said, oh my God, how are we going to do this on, on uh, uh, you know, uh, not physically meeting? Because all this well, when we talk about, you know, going out to uh, do ideation labs, it's always about physical meeting, right? And we did everything uh, virtually and we were able to yield equally, you know, uh, valuable outcomes. So again, uh, being being able to um, pivot and, and 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 be agile and be able to think and come up with the different ways of doing things regardless of the challenge. So back to your point, it is it can be seen as a challenge, but it's we think it's an opportunity, and uh, I think we're we're going on the right track on this one, slowly but surely. Yeah, interesting a point that you bring up about diversity and inclusion, right? Um, so I'll I'll go back to Paul. You mentioned about that. Um, how much uh, DNI is linked into your world of innovation and technology? Well, um, DNI is um, obviously a big, big topic, and would would probably take us the whole of this meeting and beyond to to dis to discuss it all properly. Um, it's up at the top top of our HR um, list and our people agenda as a Formula One team. And uh, I think there's a you can read a lot about what what we're doing. Um, D and I, you know, is is taking us to um, topics and learning, which is which is really exciting. Our whole organisation actually, it's raising questions about um, some of our practices. Um, so you know, to give you a, an easy one, uh, an easy example, you know, we used to be extremely selective in our graduate programmes as to our target universities. And, um, you know, we, would, we wouldn't we would hardly even advertise some of these positions. We would go to these select universities, hand out um, secret cards with um, secret website addresses and hand out to the sort of talented few, encouraging them to apply. It's very efficient at my end here because um, obviously we don't have the tens of thousands of applications to handle and stuff. And it was a, a very precise and um, sort of laser shot approach at bringing in um, talent, technical talent. Um, of course, and with hindsight, of course, that doesn't do a great deal for your um, diversity and inclusion, does it? Um, it? It brings in more of the same year on year on year on year. Um, not, not only from a gender and ethnic minorities um, perspective, but also from socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, and all of these other challenges. So it, it's not really a very um, sensible approach when it comes to DNI and ongoing innovation that we're start, starting to discuss. So, um, for example, we've very much broadened um, our um, university portfolio. We're advertising these positions much, much, much more transparency, as Farhana was talking about. Um, that's the same internally, just just by the way, we we're very keen on um, transparent um, position application and selection processes and feedback loops and so on, so that um, we get away from some of the ancient practices of um, little groups of committees selecting people to go and go and do things. We've sort of exposed ourselves to to the market. Um, and then just to sort of continue the train of, of thought, we've gone um, back from universities down um, through schools and uh, in some cases into um, first schools or primary schools. Uh, and one example for that is the work that we've been doing with the Mulberry Trust as a part of our Accelerate 25 programme. And uh, <clears throat> I'm so proud of uh, our relationship with the Mulberry Trust, I can't tell you. We discovered this uh, group of schools, extremely well run group of schools in Tower Hamlets in London. Um, when when you look at these things, some of the simple simple measures that you can see is you know the number of the pupils on free school meals gives you an idea about the sort of socioeconomic standing of that that environment. And there was about seventy five percent of pupils at these schools were on free um, school meals. Um, the pupils are speaking two or or three languages. Um, English is usually maybe a second language, <clears throat> and um, we discovered this school that was really performing well academically despite all of those challenges and we've engaged with them and we've set up a STEM Academy, um, Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths and we're running weekends and evenings and coaching and mentoring and uh, we're encouraging them into something called green power so they're racing, racing cars at weekends and assembling cars at weekends 
and and building a spirit of um, motorsport and the excitement of the competition, the team working and the performance uh, aspect right the way down into these um, these types of education environments where, you know, the, the diversity is up 75 80 percent from ethnic minority groups so you know really really exciting work and then you know just to finish the the answer to my question when it comes to innovation um our our sort of mindset on on innovation and dni is very much revolving around um a concept that we call psychological safety and um you know it was really exciting to hear mary talk about an obligation um to speak up a moment ago she might have stolen that word from uh, our our ethos um our i'm sure she didn't but uh, but she could have done we in our culture have an obligation to uh, to speak up um, we have a, a mantra called see it say it fix it um then there's a lot to say about this but just just for speed um you know you you're dealing with um, cultural backgrounds, socio-economic backgrounds, status, um, hierarchy, um, perceived seniority, um, you know, we're surrounded with PhDs, you might just have the masters, um, people have been doing the job for 20 years, you've been here five minutes, um, you've come from a background like I just described and this other person's come from this um, this elite um, school, all of, all of these things are barriers to to this notion of, of speaking up so it's quite easy for us to say everybody should speak up but yeah actually there's <clears throat> barriers of that you put yourself at risk um, when you say that could be improved that could be better have you thought about this could you uh, imagine developing things in this way so we've worked extremely hard on psychological safety and the obligation to speak up see it say it fix it we've worked at the leadership side because of course as leaders we, we need to we need to welcome this when it happens you know, this this might be irritating to a senior person who can already already see the solution and they've seen it before. They've done this for years. You know, stop getting in the way. I'm under time pressure, cost pressure, quality pressure, etc. And then then you have this um, this person from a slightly different perspective, which is what this innovation question is saying, you know, excuse me, but I, I could see this going in a in a different way. So leaders have to welcome that big investment in leadership development employees have to have the confidence and the courage to to speak up this is values this is behaviors this is how you this is where you have to have to recognize people when they do it etc 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 so um i think again i could talk talk all morning about innovation it's very central to uh, to formula one but i think from a people perspective which is us today um, the obligation to speak up and it being safe to do so is at the heart of a DNI strategy that's driven that's driving performance and innovation. Yeah, for um, definitely patronize as our culture beliefs tell us. Yeah, yes. you want to speak a little bit more about uh, that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I really resonate with that. Paul, uh, speak up is also one of our uh, cultural beliefs. That probably we took something from you as well. <laughs> Stole from you. You're welcome. Uh, but, You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, but but you're right. You know, one of the things that we've learned uh, in our innovation engine is that uh, we call it the hippo. You know, the highest pay, uh, opinion person's opinion. Um, again, you know, uh, not to box people, but you know, in the Asian uh, society, there's a lot of respect for you know the people with a, a high authority, and, and it's been really really difficult for us to also encourage speak up. And also self awareness uh, for a lot of the leaders, you know, they they may be saying one thing, you know, I want people to speak up, but the moment they do speak up, you know, they have like five seconds before they start talking again, right? So they're like, uh, didn't we just say we should speak up? <laughs> so yes, we're we're working really really hard on that one, and and what we found was especially around innovation, um, it, innovation does not come from the top. You know, innovation is a, new, a movement that comes from, you know, within, from uh, diversity, from uh, getting outside in perspective. So we're also re working really, really hard. Uh, and so, you know, recently we presented to our leadership team well, from a structured DNI. We have to say that we're fairly new uh, as an organization. We're, we're still grappling around unconscious biases um, and, and getting people just catch themselves when we're, they're, they're in a certain way that may not be aligned to what we're trying to achieve. So, you know, we said, uh, let's really make this obvious. Uh, a lot of people are, again, saying, you know, if we're really thinking about uh, 
the diversity, then it's it's the you know the differences in thinking, the cognitive uh, diversity. But why are you guys looking at gender? You know, right? So we really have to go back to the basics uh, by saying you know that's the obvious. Uh, way of, of differentiating people, but the whole point is to get diversity in thinking, and that's how we spur innovation. So it's still a journey for us, um, and um, we think it, it has to come from role modeling, uh, but we're, we're, we're doing this at all levels. Uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say that we're there already, uh, Maria. I think we're, we're, we're still in the process of, of going through, but you know, when, when someone asks us, where are we uh, from an R&D point of view? And we say we have about 500 scientists in, in Petronas. Of that, they, they're coming from 20 different countries. And there's 33% women uh, participation, representation in our, uh, our group. So that's something obviously we're very, very proud of. But that's the ability to attract. How do we then make sure that they want to stay? Uh, the pandemic obviously has helped us rethink a lot of the way that we've worked. Uh, I know, you know, from the audience um, who are from the, the research side, they said, you know, you guys can talk about working from home, but we at the labs, we've been asked to be, you know, in the, in the, in the labs uh, throughout the whole pandemic. So, you know, we're saying yes, uh, but let's see how we've, what we've learned from all that flexibility, because, you know, being, being uh, a wife and mother, I've got six children, so I do understand that it's, it's tough balancing career and, and family. And, and being a researcher is the same thing, right? You, you still need to make sure that you've got a fulfilling life. So how do you make sure that people feel excited being in the office, but also feel that they're not making major life trade-offs, right? Uh, because we do have commitments uh, you know, to the family, to ourselves, uh, to our own health, et cetera. So we, we're listening, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to give as much flexibility so that we can retain all the people that we want to retain and allow that, again, flexibility of, of not necessarily being in a single location. Uh, I know from a research point of view, the argument has always been, yeah, but you need the facilities. So that's why we have, you know, we're collaborating with a lot of the academics like Imperial College, you know, let's look at facilities that we can have uh, as part of a partnership approach and not necessarily in one single uh, place. So those are things that we're, we're looking at. Um, also as part of uh, diversity inclusion, as well, uh, and also to some extent retention, maybe I'm going back to the earlier point, uh, Maria. We're also saying, is there a way for us to really make sure that, you know, when we talk about innovation, it's not just about, you know, getting an IP or base technology. How do you really, from an organizational point of view, how do you really make it become a true revenue generator? So also we're looking at what, you know, ways in which we can remunerate people to take skin in the game. You know, they're part of that process of developing a, a particular technology. If it goes into commercial uh, level, um, can they, you know, they have some sort of a, a participation so that they can actually, you know, move it along. It's not just about the number of uh, patents or IPs that they create, but also whether it really serves the bottom line of an organization. So those are things we're also looking at. It'll be interesting to see perspectives from our two panelists on that one. Okay, I'm shifting gear back to Mary. Um, really eager to find out, you know, how do we uh, take opportunity of partnership, you know, and, and really bringing up our capabilities in terms of science and technology, for, for example. Before we do that, can I just follow up on something? Sure. I'm just going to jump in because, they, yeah, there's, a, there's just on that. I, I really okay. love this concept of psychological safety, Paul, and the, and the, the obligation question. It's really important that we and, – and how do we instill that in our people before they reach right? Because it's quite hard to learn late in life, right, that you should be questioning all the time. And, and so I, I'm really pleased that that follows through with, with your work. And it sounds, it sounds very interesting. Just that this critical thing in, in terms of diversity, we challenge to get – people in as undergraduates and and Paul's absolutely right it starts at a very young age and if you are not engaging in primary school level you've almost lost them right by the age of seven and there's plenty of psychological studies that show by the age of seven you can differentiate between pe how people feel about their place in science and technology right at the age of seven girls already think they're not as good at maths as boys right there's plenty of studies that shows this regardless of what marks they're getting they've but started to believe that they're not as good as boys. And, and if you don't address it before seven, right, you've lost a, a generation of people and you're trying to undo that work. 
In the UK, for example, at the final year of high school, only half of all state schools have any girls at all doing A-level physics, all right? So half of the schools in the UK in the final year have no girls studying physics, right? And so if you have no girls studying physics or very few girls studying physics, you can't pull them through in that pipeline, right? So we are already at a, a massive disadvantage. So getting the skills pipeline, working with younger children to engage them in science and to feel like it's inclusive and for them. And that level of inclusivity also means representation, right? So people can see that there is a path for them. It's they, they recognize where the opportunities lie. And this, this idea of cognitive diversity, it's come through both of what you've both said is really important from innovation. And, and that's a business case for DNI, right? It's not that there's a I think there's a moral case to represent our communities. There's an ethical case that everyone should have opportunity. But there's a real business case that you get better innovation from better diversity. So I think that that's that's just something really important. And, I, and I'm it's really also important that we join up our efforts, right, that that universities and industries are recognizing they've got a common challenge here. Right. They've got a common challenge in the pipeline and how we can together and, and which leads on to your partnership question. Part of that partnership actually is about how we influence future generations and how we can together develop new skills pipelines and bring people through. Yeah. So then you're going to ask me more about partnerships, right? So let's do, yeah. let's do that. <laughs> that's, that's a nice goal to go. Yeah. Mary, would you want to go first? Um, you know, uh, what kind of partnerships that's currently you're working on um, in this area? So, yeah, so... I guess if, if you go back to the Imperial College mission statement, right, says we're going to have enduring excellence in science, technology, engineering, medicine for the benefit of society, right? And this for the benefit of society is core to what we do. And what that means, of course, is that what we do in our research and education has to be translated in some way into the world, right? Or, that, or we're just talking to ourselves and we're not making any benefit. And so we recognize that to deliver innovation and to make translation happen, we need partnerships. And we use that word really specifically, right? We'd like to develop long-term, meaningful, deep, strategic partnerships. It's quite easy, actually, as an organization like Imperial, to have a lot of transactional agreements where there's a, a one-off project and we might do a little bit of good work. But that transactional arrangement doesn't give you the level of impact that we want to have in the world. So how do you go about creating these long-term engagements? And, and, and that's not easy, right? Because you, you have to come to a point where you've got a shared set of visions, a shared set of values, and an understanding of the complementarity of the skills. So what are we doing and how does that add value to the partner? And, and what does the partner bring to Imperial, right? So it has to be a two-way dynamic. Um, and so we spend a lot of time working on building those agreements, right? We put a lot of people effort into talking to, to our organizations. Patronus is a key partner of ours, talking about what are the what are the values and the challenges that we share? How can we work together to deliver that? We've just over the last year as well, um, and I know there's a lot of challenges for oil and gas companies transitioning to being energy companies renewables. A lot of time thinking about how we as an institution engage with energy companies and what does that mean in terms of the kind of research we do and and should we be engaging right i mean that's a fundamental question that all universities are being asked and our perspective has come down to that we want to have be seen as a position of a, a critical friend right so we want to see that you're changing but proactive engagement and influence right and that the work we do with you will help you make those transitions right and and part of being able to do that means that we also trust right that that your 50 30 zero statement is true and that you're delivering on it right and that really is a real movement and that we are part of that change with you so we have um i think creating these partnerships one thing in particular that we've done with the the patronus center um and, and omar mata who leaves this is really passionately engaged and um and fully committed to delivering this and he puts an awful lot of personal effort into it as well as strategic leadership is having um colleagues from Patronus spend significant amount of times at Imperial, sometimes registered as students and getting their PhD. And that's part of the upskilling opportunity space, I guess, that Farah was talking about earlier. But what it then does is people from Imperial go back to Patronus. And so there's this longer term relationship that's developed, I think, and that kind of sustains that sustains the communication. 
it means it's a longer term commitment than just if, if we had just a PhD student that we'd recruited that then may go to work for a children's or may not, right? It's part of that longer term commitment. And that's really important to us because you're going to get translation into the real world much faster that way and be able to build, I guess, on bigger bigger dynamics, right? If you're If you're very transactional, you'll probably have one project in a specific area with an organization and then it finishes. Whereas when it's strategic, you have these ongoing conversations and you, you may go, well, well, actually, I know we've been working in, in fluid dynamics, but now we want to work in renewables. And I know Imperial has got great hydrogen program or a great CCS program. How do we extend those partnerships? And so it becomes, they become much more embedded across both organizations. And so they're hard to deliver, actually. They require a lot of personal investment and commitment. But I think what the key thing is very early on that you agree to a shared set of principles, right? And a shared set of goals that you want to deliver. Um, and I think that for us, that's the way we we like to work with organizations. And we have several strategic large energy partners where we, we work in that space with. The Patronus one, I think, is particularly special because of, there's a very personal interaction between the people who are doing the research. Um, and, and that actually is a model we'd like to we'd like to try and translate to other companies. Okay. Paul, what about you? What about me? Well, I, if it's okay, I'd like to just um, add a little bit to my answer before. Um, Farry Hanna was talking about the effect of the highest paid person in the room, and um, I, I like that a lot. In our environment, we talk about a status bar, and it's it's the same it's the same concept. And um, we have worked extremely hard on a culture that remains humble, uh, which which helps us drive our sort of continuous learning. Um, we have to avoid being arrogant at all costs. And so if you were to attend, um, say, one of our race debrief meetings or any of our um, engineering meetings, um, outside outsiders coming in are always quite struck about how a lot of these meetings start. And they, they start with um, the senior people, um, the people who you'd expect to be perfect, right? Um, starting the meeting by debriefing um, their experience of whatever has happened, the race or the project or whatever it is. And as in that debrief, um, you, you would be very struck by the honesty, the brutal self-honesty um, and self-criticism that happens um, at the start of the meeting. And there's lots of um, articles written about how that gives permission to everybody in the room to be completely safe in any observation or comment that they might want to make about others or about themselves. And I think that permission builds this psychological safety concept that we were talking about and builds this obligation for people to speak up, to find those in, continuous improvement opportunities, which is what racing is certainly all about. Um, so moving on to the. Can, can the, I add the one thing to that? Can I add one thing to that, Paul? Now, now we're yeah. here. But just that. So, so Farah, you said earlier about this transition to online and and that being a challenge. And I think what we found, and I think other organisations have also now reporting, is that the online space actually allows people to speak more freely yes. and to be heard in, in in physical rooms. And it, it sounds like Paul, you've already solved this, but you often find, especially if it's a formal meeting room, you. The hierarchy of the people is set by where they sit and the physicality of how they behave, and so it then becomes very hard to be heard in that in that in that physical environment, and all that is leveled in an online meeting actually, and so it becomes much more free to speak. It's easier to be heard. You know, it's it's quite hard for someone to be ignoring a hand, a digital hand, right, in a meeting, and so and and if you've put something in the chat, it's your comment and it's got your name on it, right, and so right. people can't take other people's ideas so the online environment has actually been really good for having different voices in meetings being able to speak and I guess the challenge for us now is if we go back to physical meetings yeah. how do we keep that how do we keep that leveling that we that we found actually that's you know, a good point Maria we, we we actually observe that a lot mm -hmm. like the ability for other people to be able to speak the moment we come back in you know we were saying you know we love to have that uh you know, body language, and then we were saying, it's the body language that stops us from saying anything, you know, so yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we still get 
that 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 and and still come back to you know to some level of uh, stability, I guess. Anyway, sorry, Paul. No, I was just going to say we we have a very real real example of that. I think the effect you're describing, Mary, it sort of uh, multiplies with the size of size of the group. Yeah. And um, when we do staff briefings, for example, um, we would assemble in in the good old days um, groups of employees, maybe four or five hundred, and we'd have uh, our senior management doing a communication. And then, of course, you come to that last five ten minutes, don't you? Any questions? And um, you would get maybe one or two brave hands mm -hmm. on Teams. Uh, when we've been doing these briefings on Teams, the chat fires up down the side. Mm -hmm. Yep. In come, you know, 40, yeah. 50 questions, comments, observations. And then um, we would take one of our communications people to translate those questions to to ask them to our senior leaders who are on the stage. So I, I have lots of real examples of exactly the phenomena you're, you're yeah. talking about. Mary. Um, so partnerships. Um, I mean, there are lots of partnerships, but I, I think one of the, the great ones, it's small because um, we're, a, we're a small little uh, Formula One team. But we collaborate with um, Patronus around some of their intern development. And um, it's it's a real, real pleasure to I, I try always to participate firsthand in this. Um, it's it's small numbers, um, but uh, this this year I was delighted to see we've actually got more females coming over to join us in the UK than males, which um, I've never seen before. Um, these are technical interns. Um, that are coming over. They're on the Patronus's intern program. They're studying at uh, UTP uh, in in EPO, and um, we welcome them for um, maybe eight nine months of the year. And they come over, and they they're not coming over to um, develop skills around their technology or their chemistry. You know, they'll they'll practice some of that, of course. Um, but the primary reason that uh, that they're coming over is to develop their um, communication and their confidence and their assertiveness and their speaking up and dealing with elders and dealing with peers, dealing with celebrities um, and, and, and famous people that they see on the TV. And um, you can see, and, and coming to the UK, actually, I should say, um, often these interns are not international travellers by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, they come and they they live in an apartment and they taking care of themselves, coming to work every day. And there's some great moments when they put um, put their uniforms on. Uh, they look so sort of proud and um, just ch so chuffed, and they're sending selfies back to their families and everything. That that's their great moments. And then the other great moment is at at the end, um, where we ask them to make little presentations to some of our senior team about you know how it how it's been for them, and you can see you can see the development on on this um, attitude, on this behaviour, on this confidence. And also one of the topics that uh, we won't have time to talk about that I was hoping we might talk about is is resilience. Um, the All of the, the pressures that we have here and you'll have in all of your environments, they're overwhelming. I mean, I, I can collect a task by uh, WhatsApp, email, text, Teams, Teams messages, you know, information and messages are coming in from all different angles. And I could work 24 seven because of all of the um, the technology that we all have. And the, an, an individual's resilience these days is is becoming a differentiator, you know, an individual's battery. Um, and one of the topics um, for, let's say, these talented and let's say this higher potential, et cetera, one of the topics for this this group is to is to be able to handle all of that, and so we have a, a well-being program. It's it's called Peak, and we practice things like uh, mindfulness. We have medicals for our employees all the time, and we're teaching and training and educating everybody in our team around you know the energy battery and the health and the balance that that you need to in order to be sustainable in in work. So hopefully um, these interns, some of that rubs off uh, on them and uh, and they come back into Patronus. And then I'm re reminded of one meeting where it um, there's a hotel right next to the um, the towers in Pat in the Patronus towers in Kuala Lumpur. 
and we had a little meeting with some of the interns um, that had previously been over at Mercedes and uh, it was such such a pleasure to meet them and they they're in all the different parts of the Patronus organization and thriving and and seeing their confidence is just a, a, a fabulous thing so that's one collaboration that we're very proud of. Can I, can I just pick up on your resilience point Paul because I think it's yeah. really interesting and, and one of the things that we see with with our undergraduates right you know Imperial College we've got very high entrance grades we attract people who are used to being the best who are completely unused to failing anything and of course part of innovation and delivering innovation is being prepared to fail right so one of the challenges for us and I think probably for you is to have that kind of safe failure space and and fail small fail fail early right and but be able to recognize that that is part of the process right and actually if you haven't failed you probably haven't pushed yourself hard enough you haven't probably gone out of the box enough to deliver that and so trying to guess and I guess it comes back to safety again right how are you how are you allowed and, and how is it perceived if you do something and it doesn't work and and how you respond to that is partly your own resilience and partly the culture that you build around it right yeah may I make a quick comment on that um I I think this um in the Formula One environment we're at the prototype edge all the time mm -hmm. and uh, I, I really appreciate your comment Mary you know if you're not failing on occasion then you're not you're not pushing hard enough and um, that's very much built into um, the psychology of our team. And we have a, a saying here, which are the days that we fail are the days that our rivals will regret. And mm -hmm. you know, we, <laughs> we, we, talk, we talk about that in our uh, inductions. And the, the whole point of that mantra is it's going to happen. You know, it's mm -hmm. guaranteed <laughs> at whatever level and wherever you are, it's going to happen. And then, then the trick then is about um, capturing the learning in an honest mm -hmm. and constructive manner from various places, yourself and from other sources, and then embedding that learning in in, a, in an improvement somehow, somewhere to error proof for the next time to make us stronger next time. So yeah, the days we fail are the days our rivals will regret. Oh, such a strong words. Um, so, um, Do you want to chip in from partnership from a government point of view and? Yeah, how how precious yeah, that? Before that, you know, I just want to say, uh, Maria, and that's the reason why we collaborate with the student institution, right? We're well, learning so much from them, and and it, it makes sense. Um, you know, where we're heading, uh, thinking that an organization can do it all, is is just not making any more sense, right? Um, building great partnership, uh, having effective collaboration is key to innovation. Even the simplest things as resilience, right? I think one of the things, you know, since we're talking about it, when we're going through the pandemic and also as we're going through the, this whole innovation engine, resilience did come up. Um, again, uh, like Mary said, you know, when we go through our uh, academic credentials, when we were employing people, I mean, many people in this uh, room uh, are, are the top, uh, you know, notch, the creme de la creme of, of uh, when they graduated and they have never failed, right? So, um, and when we went through this whole innovation process, out of, you know, the, the hundreds of ideas that come, uh, that come up, only two to three would actually make through to the next round of, uh, you know, real, uh, when uh, patronas would put real money, real resources in. And um, it was tough at the beginning. Uh, you know, we almost had to, like, put them slowly back and saying, you know, it's not like we don't. Uh, like your idea, but it has just not reached that level. But now we're, we're seeing that it's okay. Uh, it's easy, better to say no to an idea that would not fly than put more money, more effort to an idea that would eventually fail. So that, that whole process of, of uh, changing, and I think, Paul, we've, we've, we've watched uh, what Mercedes uh, MG has been doing all this while. We've always said we want to, you know, pull in a lot of that culture in, and, and slowly now we're doing all that. And resilience on another level around the well-being is also a, a, a big thing. Uh, pandemic again has has uh, make it more pronounceable, and and we're now measuring resilience across the group as well, and putting in initiatives to make sure that we're able to understand different contexts and different applications. But back to the bigger point, Maria. Um, you know, uh, Petronas being a national oil company, uh, you know, one of our purpose is to enrich the lives. Uh, of the people that we work with. So whether we're here in Malaysia because we're a national oil company or when we go overseas, that has always been our mantra. And uh, a lot of the 
areas has been around education. So it, it bodes well with sustainability. You know, people are talking about corporates having uh, social responsibilities. We've been doing that for the last 45 years. You know, we, we were built uh, from ground up as a company that has a very strong social responsibility. So for many years, I, you know, when I was in corporate planning and I was doing portfolio management, and when I go to many uh, business uh, forums and they keep saying, you know, at bottom line, uh, Farhana, when we talk about portfolio, it's always about value creation. And we say as a national oil company, we've got this social uh, obligation that we actually factor in in all of our decision making and we, don't, we take it very, very seriously. Um, and that was the reason why also Petronas was open, you know, uh, was welcome to a lot of the developing countries because they saw us as a, um, a company that's just not bottom line oriented. Obviously, we've got to make money to, to, to also uh, deliver social responsibility, but we take that as a very important uh, element. So when we talk about collaboration, you know, human capital development is an important one. Uh, I love the fact, Mary, that you mentioned we, we must start from young. Uh, we do get involved in education from, you know, when they were still in primary school. We take that as an obligation. Some of us actually uh, were picked out uh, from a very young age, you know, to, to be supported by Petronas throughout. Um, but you're right, you know, even now when we're getting enough number of males and females coming in to apply, for whatever reason, when it comes to the, the final selection and choices, there, we still see that differential between choices made by girls and boys for STEM and non-STEM. And, and we know we have to do a lot more. So, you know, that uh, we're, we're actually asking a lot of our own uh, members. Maria, she's part of, you know, a lot of uh, education efforts, uh, you know, trying to bring uh, younger kids to, to appreciate STEM. We've got petroscience, you know, making science fun. We, we actually go out and teach teachers how to make science fun. Um, the education in, Petro, uh, in Malaysia, unfortunately, because of uh, has been, you know, not been stable so we have not been able to really harness you know the, the, the education as much as we would like to but you know just making science fun and, and science important making them want to do uh, science or stem is, is really important to us talk about digital program as well we we, we just launched our digital academy uh, that's really trying to you know um, repurpose a lot of our graduates and trying to get them to learn around you know how to become more analytical around digital but we said you know, let's not start once you're in uh, the system I think we've got a lot to do to help you know the, the whole industry or the, sorry the whole education system out there to, to start embracing uh, digital so you know we, we we pride ourselves in the work that we do uh, that impacts the, the, the nation and beyond. So that's part of collaboration. We can't do without it. And we know in, as part of the uh, energy transition, we have to craft more collaboration. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're talking to a lot more, you know, very uh, prominent uh, individuals and organizations uh, to do this. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm, I'm actually a beneficiary of what uh, Petronas has been investing in education. I'm a, first batch graduate of UTP, uh, so you can actually calculate how old I am, but still <laughs> very young compared to you all. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time, um, but I just wanted to, you know, uh, do this last question uh, for the benefit of the audience. Uh, they don't know that I'm going to throw this challenge to them. Uh, you're given probably 60 seconds to pitch um, why is your organization the best organization to be um, in terms of STEM, continuing um, development in STEM and technology and innovation. So I'm going to start with Paul, 60 seconds with you. <laughs> well, I guess all the um, uh -huh. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Um, well, I mean, I'm very, obviously very biased. I, I think our Formula One team has a very um, unique and special culture and um, again, a special relationship with our um, title sponsor. Um, we have a culture of, as an organization which is humble, um, never arrogant, um, continuously learning. Um, we have a psychologically safe environment where our people can all be themselves, um, be the best of themselves every day. Um, we're the team that cares. 
Um, we care for our people, uh, we invest in their well-being, um, and we have um, a great record um, in terms of our efforts around um, the DNI topic, and the results are are starting to come through. We've um, doubled the proportion of employees from ethnic minority groups over the last couple of years, and um, the proportion of females in our team is increasing all the time, and we're very proud of uh, the efforts that we're making with the Mulberry Trust, for example, working with the um, Association for Black and Ethnic Minority Engineers, uh, working with the, the STEMETs to um, broaden our appeal to students of STEM right the way down into, um, into primary school. So we're the team that cares and um, every member of our team has a voice and we're all obliged to speak up and every one of us contributes our tenth of a second um, to the track. And you can see the evidence and, uh, of our efforts on uh, in our performance. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, Paul. What about you, Mary? I think, I think now we all want to go work for Paul. That's the problem. We're <laughs> <laughs> putting me on the spot like that. That was terrible. <laughs> Mary, 60 seconds on you. Oh, gosh. So, so... I think at Imperial College, we're we're an organization that is, I think, very global. We see ourselves as a global international community. And if you come onto our campus, you'll recognize that. It's uh, extremely diverse, extremely international, and extremely collegiate environment. Um, and that's something we work hard to maintain, that dynamic international component. Um, our work is very future facing. We want to make a difference in the future and we want to deliver, I think, on that by fostering young minds, young talent, um, valuing both discovery science because sometimes the, the brilliant ideas are something you hadn't thought about. But within that ecosystem of science and technology, providing opportunities for discovery science leading to translation, leading to entrepreneurship, leading to innovation in the world. And, and we see it as a whole um, dynamic ecosystem that we foster together. And I think that's a really great innovation space at Imperial College. We've invested recently in, a, in our innovation campus. So we have our traditional old school campus, if you like, in South Kensington, which hopefully many of you will have visited. But then we have a new location out at White City where we're developing more um, interdisciplinary research hubs. We've got an incubator we've got scale space so that's very much tying together this idea of taking discovery through to innovation and translation um i think they're just like paul only any organization is only as good as the people that it brings in so we recognize and we focus on nurturing our talent bringing people through and making sure that they feel valued we're also very conscious that we are a transitory organization for people right people come and then they leave us and so we have a limited amount of time in which to, I guess, shape and influence what those people are going to be in the world. And so we feel that as a, I'm going to use the word obligation again, Paul, but it's an obligation. We have an obligation actually to those people as they pass through Imperial College that we give them the skills and the resilience and the opportunities where they can go out and um, hopefully join great organizations like, like um, Paul and Farre are, are leading. Okay, Fari, over to you. All right. Um, why? Because we, Petronas, we have a great purpose. We are a progressive energy and solutions partner, enriching lives for a sustainable future. This is what we live for. You know, we hope that people who pass us through your institution, Mary, would love to come and work for a company like ours. We're, we're not big that we're no longer, you know, we're not agile. We're, we're we're the size that, you know, we can be flexible. We understand the needs of the world. We understand the bigger purpose. We want to be part of that solution um, that, uh, you know, the world is confronted with. And we believe that a lot, a lot of that solution will have to come from within the energy industry. So we need to attract the best talents. We need to retain the best talents. We need to have great partners. And we need to uh, create great collaboration. But, uh, you know, really company like uh, Petronas, who truly believes in uh, delivering value and truly walks the talk of enriching the lives of people around around them uh, is the reason why I stayed for 30 years. And, uh, you know, you can be digging, you know, you can come in and out, but, you know, we, we, we hope that when you're with us, you truly believe that you're also delivering your own personal purpose. And that's aligned with ours. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, time flies when all of us are having fun and very passionate about something, right? Um, I am sure the audience would love to hear more from our distinguished uh, speakers, but just unfortunately, time is not on our side. What a pity. On behalf of Petronas Future Talks Organizing Committee, I thank our speakers, Madam Farihana Hanapia from Petronas, Mr. Paul Mills from Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One team, and Professor Mary Ryan from Imperial College London for such an insightful and thought-provoking sharing. To our audience, thank you for staying throughout the session. With this signing off from Petronas Twin Towers, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, I am Maria and thank you again for joining us. Thank you.